An ordained minister has decided to give up God for a year. How the heck do you just up and become atheist after being a pastor? What I'm most worried about right now is figuring out how I can live openly and honestly. I am finally free to be me. I have no idea how to find friends or become a part of a community that's not religious. What does life look like after church, after religion, after God? That's, you know, that's, that's it in a nutshell. This is the Life After God podcast, a conversation on the space between belief and unbelief and beyond with your host, Ryan Bell. Hello, and welcome back to the Life After God podcast. My name is Ryan Bell, and I'm your host. And this is episode 25. My guest today on the show is New Zealand theologian Sir Lloyd Gearing, who was born in 1918. In fact, he is going to be, later this week, 98 years old, and his theological career has spanned nearly eight decades. This is someone that I have been looking forward to speaking with uh, since I first learned of him a few years ago. Um, and I want to give you a, just a little sense of who he is before we jump into this conversation. Uh, Sir Lloyd Gearing began his career as a Presbyterian minister and then uh, fairly quickly turned to teaching theology in 1956. And then in 1967, Professor Gearing uh, was launched into uh, international uh, media attention when he was charged uh, by his church with heresy, specifically doctrinal error and, quote, disturbing the peace of the church. And those charges were brought before the Presbyterian General Assembly by a small group of conservative lay people and one conservative minister. Um, and ultimately, they were dismissed the same year. Um, but it did begin uh, what some have chronicled as a division, a deep division within the Presbyterian Church in New Zealand. Uh, Gearing has continued then his theological career uh, from that day until this present day, writing more than 17 books and giving countless lectures and public talks. He began his writing career in 1968 with his book, God in the New World. And then more recently, he's known for his books, Christianity Without God from 2002, Wrestling with God, The Story of My Life, 2007, and then quite recently, From the Big Bang to God in 2013, and finally, Reimagining God, The Faith Journey of a modern heretic in 2014. He's, he's famous for, uh, reconfiguring, uh, in his own mind and, and then offering to his readers, uh, a new post theistic take on Christianity. Um, he's similar in his uh, theological approach to other American theologians that you may be more familiar with, such as John Shelby Spong. Uh, Marcus Borg, who recently passed away, and others from the Jesus Seminar, of which uh, Lloyd Gearing is also a member. Dr. Gearing's last book, Reimagining God, was quite instrumental in my own uh, journey, especially during uh, A Year Without God in 2014. Um, he really helped me connect the dots between um, the biblical faith that I was raised with um, and this Enlightenment worldview that I had received from my education and tr helped me bridge that gap or that chasm between these two worlds and helped me see uh, one as the natural continuation and evolution of a, a very long historical process. Um, and it was really at that point that I felt quite comfortable letting go of my uh, my faith constructs. Uh, I, it was the way that Dr. Gearing very dispassionately and calmly explained where philosophically gods came from, why we maintained our beliefs in them, even though we discovered that they're, they are idols, and, and helped me without a lot of hysteria and hand-waving and hand-wringing uh, to just calmly accept that, uh, as, as Feuerbach said, um, you know, gods are, are essentially human projections. And as, as projections, uh, we can recognize that they came from us, that, that human beings created gods rather than gods, uh, creating humans. And that, 
made so much sense to me. I highly recommend it. Uh, special thanks to the West Art Institute for, for providing me with a review copy of that book back in 2014. And then recently for connecting me, uh, to Professor Gearing, uh, for this interview. So it's been a great, a great process of, of immersing myself in his work and, um, a great privilege, uh, to speak to him. And so without any further delay, uh, here's my conversation with Sir Lloyd Gearing from his home in New Zealand. Professor Lloyd Gearing, what a privilege to have you on the Life After God podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know that uh, we are separated by, by many miles and a great ocean, but by the wonders of technology, we can chat from New Zealand to Los Angeles. So it's, it's a wonderful thing. It is indeed. <laughs> your, um, your long career of scholarship and teaching first came to my attention, sadly enough, uh, in 2014. I, I don't know where uh, I was. Actually, I do know where I was. I was in the middle of uh, fundamentalist religion, so your name did not come up among my professors. Uh, but in 2014, I was taking my own faith journey quite seriously, and I started to write a blog called A Year Without God. Uh, I had come to the end of my uh, rope, as it were, in my own religious journey, and I decided to write a blog and proposed in that writing to live a year, quotes unquote, as an atheist, uh, to explore what my intuition was increasingly telling me was true, which was that there was no God. And during that year, your book, Reimagining God, came out, um, those, that collection of, of uh, essays that you put together, and it had, been, had a profound influence on me. Um, I was already a fan of Schleiermacher and Feuerbach, but you told the story so simply and clearly about the evolution of God and modernism and post-modernity in a way I finally, the, the light came on and it seemed to me for the first time I realized so clearly where gods came from and why we cling so tightly to them. Um, I say all that just, just to give you a little context of where I'm coming from, that, that this collection of essays, um, which is in a way, it seems to me, a culmination of a long journey that you've been on was came at the sort of at the beginning of a new step in my journey. Um, could you tell us a little bit to get started about your spiritual and religious journey, kind of just in the broad strokes? Well, yes, it's, it's been a pretty long journey because <clears throat> at the age of 98 next week, um, I've, uh, I've changed uh, tremendously during that time. And yet, I was never aware of any particular break. I, I wasn't brought up in the church. I, 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 in a way, was a convert in my student days and through the student Christian movement. And um, I, within a year, 1937 it was, I changed completely from being a non-church-going person to one who went twice a Sunday, taught in Sunday school, was in the Bible class, and so on. And at the end of that year, had decided to uh, train for the ministry. Looking back, I know how sort of naive I was at the time. On the other hand, it, it gave me a purpose to live for. And so that's something I've never regretted, the fact that I became a Presbyterian minister, later a theological teacher and so on. I've never regretted that because in the end, it's, um, I found a great deal of uh, satisfaction in that. Consequently, I'm, I, I don't join the modern sort of um, um, strong demoters of uh, theology and God. Mm. I rather mm. tend to see God as... A, a very uh, useful invention, as it were. And indeed, when uh, I, I go back really to um, the uh, period of the exile in the, of the Jewish people, and I think um, the first chapter of the Genesis was a, a marvelous breakthrough because what it did, you see, it, it changed polytheism into monotheism. Now, what was important was not the theism, but the mono, mm. the mono. Mm. And that, in fact, in the end, gave rise to modern science, where we see the universe as a universe, which is all connected together. Consequently, it was because of monotheism that um, modern science was able to come to light 
which it did, of course, in Christian Europe, not anywhere else in the world. Mm. It came to light because they saw everything connected as, as a unity. So while I, uh, I suppose, would normally be regarded by people as an atheist, I never speak of myself as an atheist. I'm happy to speak of myself as a non-theist. Right. But for me, the idea of God has been extremely important in bringing in the modern world. I think that was what was so striking about my reading of your book, Reimagining God, is, is that it, for the first time, I understood it not as a, a sudden departure from theism, and now we've grown up and now we're atheists, but that this was all a part of our growth as human beings along a continuum, and that the, the ideas of religion, uh, be, you know, polytheistic religion as it evolves into monotheistic religion, as you're saying, was a crucial part of our development as a species. And I just love yeah. that. Yeah, that's right. And because I, I wrote a little book um, a little while ago on, uh, on, on evolution, um, and, and <clears throat> it's called From the Big Bang to God. Mm -hmm. And um, what I, I, I learned a lot from that in helping to see the past and to understand the past, instead of rejecting the past, I think one has to understand that without the past, we wouldn't be what we are today. And, and our thinking today really rests on the shoulders of all the generations of thinking in the past. And in this little book, which I divided really into two parts, one was biological evolution, and then the evolution of, of thought. Human thought. We live in a world of human thought by which we interpret our experience. And in that respect, that all the great religious cultures, whether you call them religious or not, doesn't really matter. All the great cultures have been an attempt through language to interpret uh, the world we live in and, and to live the most satisfying life we possibly can. I think it's such a generous approach to history and something that uh, cultivates gratitude uh, for multiple traditions. While we may agree that we've evolved beyond some pre-modern notions of the world, we can still be uh, grateful for the, the effort that our predecessors put into figuring this all out. Is, is that... Indeed we can, yes. And I think that's the better approach. Is our um, people like Richard Dawkins, you know, the God delusion. Uh, I, of course, I agree with him a fair bit of what Richard Dawkins said, but I don't like his his sort of completely negative approach to the past. We've got we've got to, rather to see how God, the idea of God, has operated in the past and be grateful for it, really, in a way, and indeed. Um, I have still have a sort of use for God. God, God is, has a, is a symbol which uh, sums up our highest values, our aspirations. Uh, though it, of course, is a very subjective thing. It's not a so there's no objective God out there, but there is a God, as it were, that that uh, you, whether you use that language or not doesn't really matter. Mm. Um, there, there is something we uh, we humans have the capacity. To uh, not only to attempt to understand the world, but to live for some purpose, and God is a symbol of that purpose. Here in the United States, uh, God has been perhaps more politicized than anywhere else in the world, and so uh, you know, God is this—the word "God" is this signifier that, that, as you say, can mean any number of, of things. Oh, yeah. That's and right. in the you know we're in an election cycle here, as you know, and so uh, everyone is eager to claim God on their side, and it makes the word quite confusing. Do you? Oh, <laughs> is there a better words or better language that you tend to use besides the word God? Uh, no, I haven't found one. No, I did look, you know, <laughs> um, uh, in my own mind, the one is um, uh, is a. Uh, not, not a bad symbol. Mm. It, it refers to the unity of the universe, the unity of, of the human being in his or her thinking and so on. And when one goes back to the Jewish Shema, 
the Lord our God is one. Uh, that's a that's a very astounding statement, really, and and uh, I and it the 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 oneness of the universe and the oneness of the individual being or soul is what Indian thought.